So welcome to the Dr. Gundry podcast. I'm Dr. Stephen Gundry. This week we're speaking with Phil Kruver, or is it Kruver? Kruver. All right, Kruver. He's the founder and CEO of the Catalina Sea Ranch. So what you're saying is you uh, raise horses out on the ocean or something. <laughs> no. It's billed as the first offshore facility in the United States federal water. And I think, and many other people think, it's probably the answer for sustainable seafood for per certainly the United States and maybe the world. So Phil has been the founder of four startup companies. He served as the CEO of two publicly funded companies. So uh, that's a diverse background. How did the idea of raising mussels out in the ocean come to you? It came to me because, uh, first of all, I read about the Blue Revolution for Feeding the Planet back in uh, 2010. Uh, I had a project in uh, pa Pakistan with USAID. I said, you know, how are we going to feed these people? They have 900 uh, miles of coastline. So I started looking into it. And after a lot of investigation, I looked at the lower trophic uh, uh, marine species. Rather than fin fish, which I have nothing against, I'm, someday we may get involved with that, but you have to feed them. And there's also these issues about sustainability, uh, feed conversion ratios, et cetera. So it really boiled down to, I wanted to get into filter feeders. Uh, and it was either um, oysters or mussels. And mussels, after doing my homework, um, they grow prolifically uh, on the oil rigs uh, two miles away from where we have our ranch right now, a 100-acre ranch. And uh, they're Mediterranean mussels, naturalized over, to those oil rigs are 37 years old. So I said, you know, if they're growing out here, and I know that the oil companies have to scrape the legs every year because they get so massive, they start to jeopardize the structural integrity of the oil rigs. Hmm. So I said, fast growth, you don't have to feed them uh, as, a, as a factoid. Uh, if you have fin fish, you have to feed about 60% of your operating costs are feed. This, you don't feed the things, you stick them out on ropes, they filter feed the phytoplankton naturally uh, in the water, and they you know, get a harvest less than a year. So it was kind of like you know two and two. You look at the uh, oil rigs and say, can I do them over here? So I went down to New Zealand, got the, uh, uh, the gear, and uh, here we are. So this is actually how they do it in New Zealand with the green lip yes. mussels? Yes, it's the same technology. We, uh, our anchors, our ropes, our floats are all from New Zealand for the, our first 100 acres. It'll do about two million pounds. We are on the, uh, the verge right now. Within the next month, we will be applying to the government for another 2,900 acres. However, we now have taken the technologies and we've gone to other countries, China, India, Korea, and uh, we've reduced our capital costs by about 90%. So now, wait a minute. So you, you have a ranch out in the middle of <laughs> the ocean. And how did you, how'd you catch the little mussels to, to put it on the strings? <laughs> Well, first of all, a comment about the ranch is that uh, coming up with the name, with Catalina, we're not next to Catalina. We're six miles off of Huntington Beach in U.S. federal waters. It's about another 15 miles to Catalina, but Catalina has an iconic name. I certainly didn't want to use farm. It alliterates with filthy. Mm -hmm. And when people say farm, woo, type of thing, and ranch is kind of California. So that's where we came up with the name with Catalina Sea Ranch. Answer your question. Currently, we are uh, buying the seed uh, from Oregon. There's, a, there's only two hatcheries on the West Coast that produce seed, or spat they call it, for mussels. One's in the state of Washington and one's in the state of Oregon. Uh, we just had a delivery of about 200 million seed yesterday. 200 million? million 200 million. So these were 43 ropes that are 100 feet long, just loaded with, you could barely see them. It's like a little pepper type of thing of, of, of mussels. And when they came in by uh, Federal Express, we picked them up, uh, put them on our boat, went out to the ranch 10 miles away from our shoreside facilities, and we tied them onto a, a backbone rope. And uh, they start today, they are filtering and growing very fast, and it's rapid growth up to uh, about two inches, and then they grow very slow. Hmm. And so it takes about a year from seed to harvest? That's correct, about okay. one year. Now, do you, I mean, do you have to have divers go down there and tend them or anything? No, the, we're, we're out there every day, uh, at least five days a week, but most of the work is um, putting more floats on. So as these 
uh, let me describe the, the, the cultivation gear. So we have 100 acres, we have 40 what we call backbone lines on it. Each backbone line is 600 feet long and we're all the, the entire place that we're located and the expansion is called the San Pedro Shelf and um, it's all 150 feet deep. It's the largest underwater plateau on the west coast and this is not strategy or intelligence. This was serendipity. We just fell into that. You know, said, so, whoa, this is perfect for it. So it's 150 feet deep. What makes it really interesting is that then it drops off to 3,000 feet and there's this phenomena of upwelling. So the California currents come up and it just takes these nutrients and floods that shelf so that they have food for the filter feeders. So anyway, going back to the gear, uh, there's, there's six, 40 600 foot lines and under that is draped the grow out lines 30 to 50 foot all continuous for 10,000 feet. So once they go, once we put the seed in in about three months they grow really fast to about as big as your thumbnail and then we go out with these machinery from uh, um, from New Zealand and uh, if we take that rope and you stick it through it goes through a little orifice and just peels them off 10,000 pounds per hour washes them, cleans them, and we put them in a bag. And then we drive, to, after harvesting all day, uh, we go back to Shoreside and our distributor's there with a refrigerated truck. We unload it with a forklift, and uh, that's the life of the muscle. Hmm. <laughs> so you, you didn't have to do anything to these guys, because uh, as you know, and our listeners, we're, we're very suspicious of farm-raised fish and farm-raised shellfish like shrimp. But your farm is not doing that, correct? Our ranch is, <laughs> you have to get away yeah, from the ranch, farm. Yes, a ranch. ranch. Uh, yes, our ranch is uh, it's very sustainable. Uh, when I started, that was so important to say sustainable, and we got away from shellfish. Now, but the the real proper terminology we're doing is mollusks, but that people don't understand. That's so we right. say sh shellfish. But just in the last year, it's changed from sustainability or in addition, it's called regenerative. So it's not just sustainable as a crop, but also it's regenerating the ocean. Uh, not only the, the, the uh, mussels or the mollusks, but also the seaweed that we're all, we're, we'll, we will be growing in the future. So I think that's a really good point uh, because sustainable is, is one thing, but regenerative. T tell me about filter feeders. Um, there's a lot of worry that filter feeders like mollusks um, are eating toxins, eating filth, eating heavy metals, radioactive from <laughs> Fukushima. Give me your thought of, you know, free out in the ocean filter feeders. What's the difference? So most of the aquaculture, uh, let's say mollusk, or, or let's just stick right to mussel. Mussel uh, uh, farms uh, in the United States, worldwide, they're close to shore. They're in bays and estuaries. There's runoff uh, in the urban areas from the, you know, the storm sewer lines that come in, uh, in the agricultural areas. Uh, 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 there's all kinds of runoff uh, from the cows and sheep and so forth. So there is a lot of nutrients, but it's a quality of the nutrients. Where we are, six miles offshore, we've done all the evaluations and so forth. There, the, the stormwater pipe from Orange County doesn't come close. If they monitored very closely, so all the the, the food that, that our um, crops are consuming all come from 3,000 feet down, coming up from the bottom, and it's clean uh, phyto, uh, phytoplankton, chlorophyll that makes them that makes them eat. But what they do have, or what they can filter. It's, there certainly is no chloroform. Uh, 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 chloroform. Uh, there's uh, there's there's no bi bacteria. The big thing is biotoxins. There are two prevalent biotoxins in Southern California that we have to test. Some people call it a red tide, and it doesn't kill the shellfish. But if a human or a seal or bird or wildlife uh, that uh, that they eat the uh, mussel, uh, then they will get sick or die. 
But so what we do, we have to test before every harvest to make sure we send it to a federal lab uh, or state lab. They, they evaluate it, how many parts per, if there's any of the uh, biotoxin. And then uh, they release the, the, the crop. The next day they say, there's no biotoxins of a certain level. And we haven't had any problem with it so far. But we have to test for that. But the shellfish doesn't die, and if, the, if there wasn't, unfortunately, a, a, a red tide that were loaded with the biotoxins, it would drift off, and then they would flush that within a day. Yeah. So they wouldn't have it, and then we keep testing it, and then we could put it back on the market for sale. So they wouldn't incorporate it into their flesh. That's correct. That's correct. Gotcha. Now, uh, the other thing is with uh, scallops. Uh, you eat the medallion, and that will not accumulate the uh, biotoxins. So that's kind of an interesting thing as well. But because uh, that's uh, just the muscle, just itself. the muscle. Yeah. yeah. So this whole fear, which has been founded since you know almost pre-recorded history, that you know shellfish are bottom feeders and they're full of filth and danger. Do you still hear that? Do you? I mean. You do with wild mussels, and Belgium's a huge area for consumption, but those are all wild, so they're on the bottom, and they do have grit, and they have to deprivate them and clean them out. Ours are all suspended. We're in 150 feet of water. The backbone line of where they're all draped is 20 feet under the water, and then, uh, so we're, we're 100 feet below from the sandy bottom type of thing. So no, we, uh, we don't have to deprivate them. They're clean. Uh, after, we, after, after we harvest them on the boat, uh, they're ready to go into the marketplace. So the idea that I'm going to have a mussel and I got to be really careful because there might be sand or grit. Uh, no, you won't have that. And you happen. mentioned the, the heavy metals. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're down on the bottom. If they were you know, bottom feeders, they, they would be susceptible to that. But heavy metals don't come up there. We, have, we, we, we don't have to test for them. It's not even a concern as far as the health authorities are concerned. Now, mollusks in general are, are great cleaners of the ocean. Is that a pretty good description? Absolutely. So the, the data shows that a, a large gigas mussel, I'm sorry, oyster, uh, will filter 50 gallons of water per day. A mussel, a little bit smaller, ours two and two and a half inches, uh, do about 30 gallons per day. There's some really interesting YouTube uh, videos where they, they put a mussel into a dirty uh, container, and then uh, after you know, 24 hours, they do a time lapse like that, and it just cleans it all. But the dirt's not in the muscle flesh. That's correct. They, they put it, it's called pseudofeces. They get, they, 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 they get rid of it. See, I think that's probably the biggest point uh, that you can make to your audience, my audience, that you know, everybody thinks that this stuff is ending up in muscles, and it's not. Well, the, the key is, uh, to me, is if it's the traditional onshore, it could be in right. there. Even though, the, even though they go through deprivation with UV lights to kill the bacteria, you still have that in there. Our muscles are offshore, so they're filter feeding really pure uh, phytoplankton that, uh, that's not contaminated with anything. So you don't have to treat it with a UV light and Nothing. all that? Uh, most, uh, um, the, well, many of the, um, the nearshore farms are actually unacceptable for shellfish cultivation, but they get around that because they do the de deprivation and they kill the bacteria. There is no bacteria out where we are. We don't even have to do it. We're, the, we're, we don't have, we're not the only ones that don't have to do that. So if the month doesn't end in an R, you can still have them? Yep, yep. <laughs> so uh, that's with spawning and the, um, and the, the Typically, a bivalve or a mollusk will spawn twice a year. So they do it, with, it's, a, it's a natural thing with them. When the temperatures change, they do it in spring and the fall. Uh, they, they, they know it's time to propagate and so forth, so they spawn naturally. And that's when we have our spawns up at our hatcheries. Yeah. But we're overcoming that now. So what we have done, uh, we've got a Small Business Innovative Research Grant from the United States Department of Agriculture. Uh, it was to, to develop cryopreservation. It just clicked to me, say, well, here's a good thing. I'm not a scientist, I'm not a farmer, or whatever like that. I'm an outlier, and I, I just, I'm an entrepreneur. And I said, you know, we've been uh, freezing human embryos for decades. Why can't we do it to get rid of this cycle with uh, uh, cryopreserve uh, larva larvae? So we got this grant, we got a 70% of success. No, so now we have seed on demand. So it's, it's a big uh, door uh, you know, of uh, liquid nitrogen. Yeah. And so when we want to have a spawn, they pull it out, 
stick it in, and now we're ready to go. So you're, you're using European mussel stock. Can you grow a green lip mussel? They would grow there, and the uh, regulatory authorities would never let you do it. So, ah. so there's two types of mussels uh, in, in California that grow on the rigs all around. Uh, the native uh, one is called a California anus. Uh, I know it's not really Excuse good for me? branding, yeah. But the other <laughs> one is the uh, Gallo Pro Provincialis, which actually came from Spain, but it was so many years ago that it's considered naturalized. It's not native, but it's naturalized. So the, you know, they're, they're, they're so prolific uh, two miles away. They're all around the shoreline and everything else. They're really preferred by the chefs. So we have no problems with doing it. But you can't, enter, you can't bring in a, introduce a foreign uh, mussel. Say on the East Coast, it's called edulis. Uh, I don't know how well they'll grow there more in the cold water. I don't mm -hmm. know if they'd even survive. But the regulatory authorities, uh, both in state and federal, will never allow you to put those in there. So we're using a naturalized mussel that's, um, uh, that's enjoyed by the chefs. So they're naturalized, so they have American citizenship? Yeah. Or? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, okay. So uh, as you know, I'm a big fan of shellfish and mollusks. Uh, a lot of the reason for the omega-3 content. And uh, the other thing I like about farmed mussels is they're not farmed, they're, they're ranched. Ranch. Um, tell, me, tell me all about the omega-3 content in, in mussels uh, compared to other things. So the, the, the big push now, uh, I'll, I'll work into this, but the big push now is we have a 15 billion, uh, underscore billion, not million, seafood trade deficit. Uh, Secretary Ross, the Department of Commerce, uh, when he was confirmed, he went on record. He said, I've got my eye on that, four, at that time, $14 billion seafood deficit. He said, we have the largest EZZ economic zone in, in, of all the countries. We should be net exporters rather than importing $15 billion. So that has increased. So what, since, he, uh, since he went on record during his confirmation hearing, uh, according to NOAA, uh, United States uh, it increased its seafood trade deficit by $1.1 billion in 2017. So we're importing $15 billion worth of seafood, and 90% of, 90% of, a little over 90%, comes from China and Asia. So why can't we grow our own? So what, what we're looking at is expanding. Uh, we're, we feel we have a first mover advantage. We're, uh, you know, we've got the first permit in federal waters. That's the only place you're gonna get expansion. Uh, as an example, in California, if you wanted to have, uh, grow mussels, eat anything that's sustainable, seaweed or whatever, they, you're not gonna get a permit. California has not issued a permit in 22 years. So if you're three miles to the shore, you're in California waters, you're not gonna get a permit. We've jumped over that, we're six miles out. And uh, that's federal waters. Only the Army Corps of Engineers has uh, jurisdiction. Uh, so it's a building permit, no term on it. This is something I, 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 was, I learned about in October of 2011, and I went, whoa, did I hit the jackpot on this, you know, type of thing. So anyway, um, there's great opportunity for expansion uh, to, to reduce this uh, seafood trade deficit. Uh, you were talking about omega-3, or asked about omega-3s. Of the $15 billion, six billion is shrimp. And the, the scientific literature uh, to a search shows that uh, mussels have three times the omega-3 content as shrimp, which in shrimp, by the way, is one of the most devastating to both the farm plants for the mangroves and then the wild caught because of the bycatch and everything else. So I always say if I could only get Leonardo DiCaprio to eat a pizza with mussels on it instead of sausage, then our branding is gonna make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> Let me work on that. <laughs> or maybe Dr. G, yeah. How, we got to get you to eat one. Absolutely. Uh, well, you, you brought yes. some. So, uh, you know, that's a good question. Uh, I just got back from Europe last week in, in France and Italy, and every restaurant, I mean, literally, and I was on primarily the shore, uh, has mussels. And people are eating mussels for lunch, they're eating it for dinner. I didn't see it on the breakfast menu, but there should be. Yeah. Why, what's the cultural difference? Why don't Americans in general, that's kind of down the list of uh, shellfish and mollusks? What, explain that. Great, great uh, question. 
Because when I got into the business, I, I, I found out about the um, um, part of the deficit is that we import 30 million pounds of uh, live mussels, underscore live mussels, from Prince Edward Island, 100,000 people, 3,500 air polluting miles away. And then, of course, I'm out there on the oil rigs diving and I see all these mussels and find out they have to scrape them and everything. And I say, well, why can't we grow our own type of thing? So the numbers, though, is because we, uh, I think we have substandard mussels, people just don't eat. In fact, a lot of people ask me, so you're, you're growing it, what, is that bait? They think of it as bait. So the numbers are, in the United States, the average per capita consumption uh, annually is 0.15 pounds for America. Uh, in Europe, generally, it does, you know, changes from each country, it's about five pounds per capita. In New Zealand, only seven million people, but it's 33 million pounds per capita. So my big pitch to my investors is that everybody likes local now. So we got a local muscle. There's 40 million people in California. If I get up some way or another with uh, maybe having Dr. G uh, eat a couple of these things, talk about the nutritional value and so forth, the education, the awareness. But if they could get up to five uh, uh, pounds per capita in California, now you got 200 million pounds, you got a couple bucks per pound, you got a half a billion dollar industry. So th that's my big dream and goal. Okay. So how, segue to that, how do we get people to try mussels? Um, is it a tough sell or are you working with chefs? Or yes, we are. In fact, last week, um, uh, the chef from uh, Nomad LA, I've never even heard yeah. of it, it was a wonderful restaurant. It was Fabulous. Voted, the one in New York was voted the uh, number one restaurant in the United States and the world. But he last year was the number one sh uh, young chef in the United States. Mm -hmm. He took our muscles and he went to uh, uh, New York and he won this uh, Vitamix uh, ch uh, challenge. He came in number one and number two. He actually took the, our muscles and he put them in a Blender, that's what was sponsoring it. Yeah. And he made this incredible recipe and uh, that's gonna get a lot of publicity type of thing. So it's, I think it's the, it's the awareness of the, the nutritional value, unique um, recipes that people could try. Or when you go to New Zealand, you have muscle sausages, you have muscle, you know, everything is muscle. I'm looking at a muscle hot dog now, that the, you know, the ingredients try, try to promote that. So it's just, it, but it's gonna be an uphill battle. You know, people just have that uh, kind of negative thing about oh, muscle, why do you do it and so forth. So it's gonna be a lot of branding. One, one of the things that impresses me about muscles and shellfish in general is this, our brain uh, is anywhere from 60 to 70% fat. And half of the fat in our brain uh, is a component uh, omega-3 called DHA. Uh, the other half, in interestingly enough, is arachidonic acid. Now, a lot, a lot of people are very afraid of arachidonic acid, the evil omega-6 fat. If it was so evil, then half of our brain would not be made out of it. And one of the fascinating things, not only do shellfish have a lot of omega-3 DHA, but they actually have arachidonic acid. And there's some very compelling evidence that one of the reasons that we are such a big brained animal is that long ago we built our big brain by eating primarily shellfish and you and I were talking off camera that certainly on the east coast uh, early on we really founded America on oysters and clams and mussels and we paved our streets with the leftover shells and so I think there's hope, uh, number one, but I think the more I can convince people that they should be eating these foods for their brain, uh, you know, mom always said fish is brain food and, and she was right. And you're right, you know, fish, at least the way we're doing it now, is not a sustainable thing. Um, and certainly I'm very cautious about farm-raised fish, because we're, you're right, we have to feed them, and the things we've chosen to feed them are not good for them or for us. So I'm, I, you know, when, when we get in contact, I just think this is one of these ways where you can make a difference for the environment, and you can probably make a difference uh, for people's health, uh, which is 
what a double good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so you don't have to feed these guys, huh? No, no. You're not a, sprinkling some no, fertilizer no, out on the ranch. No, no external externalities, and uh, you know with the the changing climate and the droughts, and uh, there's a lot to be said about uh, offshore aquaculture, uh, uh, particularly the low trophic uh, aquaculture that uh, don't have to be fed. Uh, the one thing about that is that the feed conversion ratio, they're starting to get that down one to one, but as an example, farm-raised uh, tuna, it's 50 to one. So you have to put 50 pounds in of uh, anchovies or other type of forage fish to get one pound out. So we don't have to do that. We just, that's why they're so profitable. We put them out there, we keep putting floats on there as they grow to keep them from keep taking, a, you know, keep the, we'll keep the lines from sagging. Right. So each line, uh, uh, you know, it's 10,000 feet, we get about five to seven pounds per foot. So you've got 50,000 pounds of weight pulling it down. So we're out there, we've got thousands of floats, 120 and 300 uh, liter floats out there to keep suspending that backbone line. So these are the Arnold Schwarzeneggers of the <laughs> sea. I mean, they just pump you up huh? yeah, just, yeah, yeah. just by filtering. Yeah, well, it's just, it's, it's, and you know, another really interesting um, uh, positive is that uh, where we're located, there's no habitat. So it's all just, you know, it's open sea, all 150 feet deep on this plateau, yeah. mud and sand, so it doesn't attract the fish. Right now, Catalina Sea Ranch is the hottest fishing spot in Southern California because all the, it's habitat there, little fish climb around on it, the big fish come through, so when the yellowtail, which is a pelagic, they come through uh, three Sundays ago, I went out there on a Sunday because I, I, I kind of keep an eye on things. There was over 200 recreational fishing th boats on top of the ranch. What are they doing there? Isn't there a sign say yeah, Cal Catalina we, Sea Ranch, we keep out? Them. We welcome them because uh, the, the recreational fishing industry is in the billions of dollars and we want support for our expansion. So I go out there and I'd say, hey, write a letter of support for us type of thing. You know, this is good for, it's attracting fish. It's, it's, a, it's a good thing. So is, you know, are Bass Pro Shops your sponsor or well, something? No, no, we're, we're working on that, we're working on that. <laughs> I, mean, I think that's a natural. <laughs> So, so I mean, big ships and things, they don't have to, you don't have to worry about them or they're not in a... Well, we're right outside the two largest ports in the United States, the port of LA and the port and of Long, Long Beach. Beach yeah. And uh, it was kind of interesting, a little anecdotal story, uh, story is that when I had the idea, I didn't know about the traffic lanes when these ships come in. Now they're on the outside of the oil rigs. There's four oil rigs that are two miles further out. And so the transit lines for these big ships, which have a, a, a keel 40, 50 feet deep, oh, they would, they would tear everything down. But why we're lucky here is that the ship lanes are outside. Uh, every, every boat that has a, uh, it's over 60 feet as of a couple of years ago, they have to have an AIS, so they have to transmit data, what they are, how big they are, and so forth. And we're within, the, it's called the vessel the transit of uh, Long Beach. So they're watching it with the radar all the time. So if there was some errant uh, large vessel that for some reason uh, wandered off, they could, uh, they could alert them and then they would send the Coast Guard out right away. So no, we're not in the fishing lanes, but for the commercial fishermen, the recreational fishermen, the people who are not in the way of people going to Catalina uh, like that, they don't have to go around us and so forth, they go right over the top. Doesn't, doesn't hurt us. We lose a, fl a couple of floats once in a while. And by the way, they all have my cell phone on it. That was one of the regulatory requirements. So I get, every once in a while I'll get a call from someone saying that, the, hey Phil, we got one of your floats that landed up here. So we go and we read. And thanks for the mussels. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> well we do, we bring a bag of mussels. Thank you for reporting, because it's, you know, it's a couple hundred dollars. Now, how big are these floats? Uh, uh, the, the ones that are subsurface are 120 liters, and the top ones are 300 liters. So they're about like, like this, circular. So you can see them. Yeah. 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 It's and not like a little buoy thing. No, when you go out there, it's uh, love to have you come out, by the way. So all you'll see is we have four corner, uh, <clears throat> 100 acres, it's 2,000 feet. And so we have four corner uh, buoys, not floats. And then we have what's called a nomad buoy. Uh, it was given to us by NOAA. It's uh, 17,000 pounds, but it transmits data into the cellular network at Huntington Beach and Verizon in real time. So 
in the morning, you go up there, you can see what, what's going on, I keep an eye on things and so forth. But it's transmitting data, but for two purposes. One, for our husbandry, you know, we know the oxygen, we know the phytoplankton, mm -hmm. richness of temperatures and all this stuff, but also for uh, regulatory compliance, making sure that there is no measurable impact, whether it be positive or negative. And we think it's gonna be positive. So how, so you're a, you're a sea rancher, how do you how do you harvest these guys? You go down when they're with divers and pick the little fellas off, no, uh, or when when they're they're ready to go. We have about a million and a half pounds ready to go right now. They're growing very slowly. Uh, ready means about two inches long, two to two and a half inches. Uh, we pick up that grow line that's ten thousand feet, shove it into this. Uh, it's called a declumper, and it just strips them off, and then it goes into a, a, a washing machine type of thing. Goes up a conveyor, and then it's graded because they're different sizes. So we only sell the large and the mediums. I brought mediums today. The little ones we reseed and stick them back out on the, uh, huh. uh, the on the on the ranch, and so that th we bag and tag them. It's required by federal law that any shellfish. Um, has to have a tag on it, and it follows that shellfish to the consumer. So if you go to a restaurant, if you go to a grocery store, by law that you have to say, well, can I see the tag? And they have to show it to you. So it will show it when it was harvested and where. So where, where can we find the Catalina Sea Ranch mussels? Well, right now, mostly in Southern California. Uh, the first round of capital that we raised were all the seafood, uh, or the, the major seafood distributors. Yeah. So we, uh, right now our distributor for shellfish is DiCarlo uh, Seafood. They have about 80% of the market in Southern California. Uh, one of my founding directors is uh, Roger O'Brien, who is the CEO and chairman of Santa Monica Seafood. Ah, okay. I'm sure you've heard that yep, name. Yeah. Yep, so, yep. so anyway, uh, it's being distributed by both of them and other uh, seafood distributors. You can find them in restaurants. And, and we're, we're putting that up. I have a new marketing guy we're going to put a, on our website where you can find the mussels as, as, they, as they're being harvested. So is your goal Costco or is that? No, I think it's, it's fresh and uh, Costco takes a, we buy from them, by the way. We, all of our competitor mussels, we go out every week, we buy them, and we do meat to shell ratios, count oh, really? per pound. Oh, yeah, we want to know, we want to make sure that we have all the data that we have a superior mussel, not and, only local uh, and fresh. Can looks, you tell? I mean, it, 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 you it, got it, a better mussel than it, Costco? It, it, it looks really good. It looks really, really good. And we're improving upon it. We have a selective breeding program. We're building a hatchery so we don't have to take these mussels from Oregon that we could uh, spawn them ourselves. So we're in the uh, process of construction. I have a meeting this afternoon about that. Uh, so we'll have our own hatchery and uh, have our control over our own destiny with a higher performing mussel uh, and other type of bivalves as we expand into them because of selective breeding. Nobody's doing that. I mean, it's just incredible. And, and, and a guy who just went into this for fun. Exactly. <laughs> a challenge. A challenge. Everybody yeah. said, you'll never get a permit, Phil. And I said, oh, I got, I got to do it now. That's the, that's the challenge. And so, I mean, are, are you going to become the, the, the muscle king of America? Or, I mean, what, what's your goals in all yeah, of this? Well, thank you for asking. Because uh, I really see that. Uh, I've, I've been pitching. I actually trademarked the uh, uh, aquaculture capital of America. And I really believe that. Uh, we're in such an incredible location. Number one, this plateau that has 40 square miles or 26,000 acres in U.S. federal waters where all you have is one regulatory agency, the Army Corps of Engineers, they give you a building permit. So expansion, being the first mover advantage and so forth. Uh, I'm looking at 3,000 acres. I think that's gonna keep me busy for a while, but it'll be 1,000 acres of mussels, 1,000 acres of, of seaweed or kelp, giant kelp, and then another 1,000 acres we call cage culture, experimenting with oysters, mussels, uh, abalone. We're trying that, we've actually tried that. That seemed to do fairly well, but you gotta feed them kelp but not other outside, but you have to go out and feed them. So will they be as profitable? I don't know. I want you to take over the little purple sea urchin culture. Well, yeah, we're, we're, we're going to experiment with that, see if that's a possibility. Uh, take them from where they're devastating the giant kelp and Palos Verdes and transfer them out there and feed them, uh, uh, bulk them up, and then uh, try to sell them. All right. So as this journey changed your health, or are you eating more muscles than you used to? <laughs> Uh, you know, I've always loved mussels, uh, primarily being from the East Coast, and uh, I had mussels last night. 
Uh, they were fairly good. So I, I eat them very, very frequently. Not that they're good for you, I just love them. I don't eat them mostly, as, well, I never eat them for breakfast, but you know, in the evening time, it, they're, they're just wonderful. So yeah, it's a, it's a healthy, healthy, healthy food. I, th I think you need a muscle breakfast sausage. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, your detractors, when you came looking for money or, What'd you tell them? Obviously, you you built other companies, which helps. But why did you? How'd you convince them that you could do this? Well, you know that that's, uh, I have a lot of uh, experience with uh, capital formation, and, uh, but I really underestimated the challenge of raising millions of dollars for a muscle farm offshore. Uh, I could, ranch, I mean, I, please. Yeah, ranch. I know. But I, that's <laughs> I, the way they say those farms. So anyway. Um, <laughs> I, I would call uh, institutional capital people, you know, VCs and so forth, yeah. and I, they'd say, can we put you, I, I got my colleagues here, can I put you on the speaker box? I could hear them giggling in the background. You gotta be kidding type of thing. But to me, it just made perfect sense. So the, the success was uh, we, we did it with accredited investors, and most of them were mission driven. It wasn't that they want to make a lot of money or everything else. They said, hey, this sounds good for the ocean. Uh, this is kind of like my donation, my contribution. They're very wealthy people uh, to, for improving the environment. So that's where our first rounds came in. And uh, uh, we're doing the same thing right now. There's a, a new emerging group of people called Impact Investors with major funds. And uh, they're trying to do social good by investing in, thing, in, in companies that are sustainable that will help the planet. And uh, next week I go to Connecticut for 10 days uh, to meet with or, or to go to a workshop with them. So that's kind of the, uh, the investor community we're uh, approaching. So show us the muscles. All right. We brought them. So these were harvested yesterday. So yeah. Mediterranean mussels, they're about five pounds. So they're still alive. Still alive. Oh, they're, they're and for the neophyte, if the shell is open after you cook them, uh, it's, it's, it's good. It's good, yeah. And if it's not, don't, don't, don't do it. Don't eat it, yeah. Okay. And give us just an idea for people who don't understand. How do you cook a mussel? It all depends. What I like yeah. is what it's like, like 10 minutes. Just I, I put it in with beer, a lot of garlic. I'm a garlic uh, aficionado type of thing. And that's it, beer or wine and uh, garlic. But there's so many other type of ingredients that you could put that with them. And typically a mussel will taste like the ingredients you cook them in. That's mm -hmm. what's good about it. So there's a lot of variety, a lot, a lot of opportunity to be very creative. Yeah, I like uh, coconut curry mu uh, mussels. Oh, it's really good. We have to really share good. that recipe with me. Oh, all right, <laughs> okay. All right, well, we're definitely gonna do that. Okay, well, this, is, this has been great. Now, I mentioned before we take an audience question before we finish up. So I've got the audience question today from Michael Gonneville. I think that's correct. Uh, Dr. G, your best, if a person needed to cut one thing from their diet, what would you suggest? Food or liquid? I know it depends on each individual. What's your thoughts? Well, again, in the plant paradox, I tell you it's not what I tell you to eat that's important, it's what I tell you not to eat. But I'm gonna give you, actually I just got this uh, email today from uh, one of my uh, colleagues in Sweden and there's a new paper out uh, looking at the toxicity to our microbiome from artificial sweeteners. Uh, you know I talk about this a lot, but there's a new study that kind of backs up the Duke study that uh, a packet of Splenda, for instance, will kill 50% of your microbiome in your gut, one packet. And this paper, uh, which I haven't finished reading because I literally got it this morning, shows that all of these sweeteners, whether it's saccharin, whether it's NutraSweet, whether it's Splenda, sucralose, are lethal to friendly bacteria in our gut. And it's dose related. And as you remember, I was a eight Diet Coke a day addict and running and going to the gym and eating healthy and wondering why I wasn't losing weight. And it's one factor, but one of the things I really urge you to do is just ditch the diet soda. And among other things, families, please do not give your children fruit juice. 
apple juice is not an appropriate food for a child. Do not give them orange juice in the morning. I know that sounds like heresy, but these are pure sugar products. So ditch the juices, ditch the artificial sweeteners, and we'll be well on our way to better health. Okay, so where, where can your audience find you? Do you have a website that they can visit to learn all about you? Yes, it's uh, www.catalinasearanch.com. That seems easy. Mm -hmm. And just don't type in farm. Right, okay. absolutely. <laughs> Cat Catalina Sea Ranch, all right. And if I may say, we also have loads of videos. So you click on our Facebook or our YouTube. Uh, there's at least 200 videos there that yours truly, uh, that's my hobby. They're, they're cheesy videos, but uh, they recorded everything that we've done in the last three years for uh, become the aquaculture capital of America. All right, and, and do you have any cooking videos on your we, we, we do. We have uh, we've taken out the 50 chefs at one time. We have a research vessel called the Captain Jack. It's a 111-ton, 75-foot vessel, and uh, we love to take chefs out. People, you're invited. We would welcome I'd love to you come to come out. out. We'll bring a couple of my James Beard award-winning friends, and Whoa. We'll, we'll go for it. Fantastic. All right. Fantastic. All right. Well, so thank you for joining us. I really appreciate you making the trouble. So for more information about this week's episode, please take a look at my show notes below and on drgundry.com. Uh, in the show notes, you'll also find a survey and I'd love to find out more about you. Please take a few minutes to fill it out so I can do my best to provide information you're looking for. And I'll give you a follow-up. I was filling up with gas in Palm Springs yesterday on my way uh, westward to LA and I was putting diesel in my diesel car, and uh, 39 miles per gallon, by the way, and uh, in an SUV, and a gentleman in an Audi, doesn't make any difference, was filling up next to me, and he says, you're Dr. Gundry. And I said, yeah, I am. <laughs> and he said, love your podcast. My wife and I, and the wife's waving, he said, your podcasts are great. So. Thank you for that follow-up. And by the way, he says, I have a wonderful voice just like David Letterman, and I, we're both from the Midwest. So. Uh, so thank you for listening. Stop me. I was stopped all over Europe. We're, this is a movement. So and we're, we want to promote things that are going to save the planet. And by eating mussels from the Catalina Sea Ranch, you're not only going to save the planet, but you're gonna save your brain, and that's what we're all about. So, remember, I'm Dr. Stephen Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you. <laughs>